Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first panel session of the International Conference of Sustainable Management and Innovations. It is my great pleasure to lead this panel session with honorable speakers. In this session, we will discuss very important issues on sustainability and innovation related to our current situation. Today, we are confronted to difficult situation, namely global pandemic that hit global supply chain and also world economies. At least three issues rise as a major challenges that need to be addressed. They are food, human, and also business. They are connected each other. The pandemic hit human health, food supply and distribution, as well as business continuity. In this special event, we are happy to have three distinguished speakers from three reputable universities to address those issues. So, around 11,000 kilometers from my chair in Germany, there is a professor of agricultural economics from Leibniz University of Hanover that spent much time in research on agriculture, food, and vulnerability to poverty in developing countries, especially Southeast Asia. I'm proud to introduce to all of you Professor Dr. Herman Weibel. Guten Morgen, Prof. Weibel. Selamat pagi. Guten Morgen, selamat pagi, selamat sore. Pagi. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Weber also was my PhD supervisor and uh, University of Hanover and IPB has very close collaboration for about 10 years uh, cooperations and uh, Professor Weber also frequently uh, come to IPB to do teaching and also to have research in Indonesia. So I will uh, show uh, the curriculum vitae, maybe the committee can share the curriculum vitae of Professor Herman Weibel. Yes, Professor Herman Weibel is the director of Institute of Development and Agricultural Economics, Faculty of Economics and Management, University of Hanover. Uh, his research priorities are impact assessment of international research on food security and agriculture, poverty, and he also project director of research, uh, special research program on vulnerability to poverty in Southeast Asia. And of course, there are so many uh, publication and journal, and he is also a reviewer in some reputable journals. And then about 1,000 kilometers from me, there is a next speaker, who is a professor of strategy and policy from National University Singapore Business School. I am happy to introduce Professor Andreas Raharso. Selamat siang, Prof. Andreas. Siang, selamat siang kembali. Alhamdulillah, mudah-mudahan selalu sehat. Di Singapura sudah uh, COVID-19 sudah berakhir ya, kelihatannya. Bisa terkendali, belum berakhir, terkendali. bisa terkendali dengan baik. Kita berharap di Indonesia juga bisa seperti itu. Terima kasih banyak atas kesediaannya. Prof. Andreas uh, will deliver ideas about the role of human resource in the era of new normal. I think this is also a very important issue. And the last is the, uh, I will, the committee will show the curriculum sheet of Prof. Andreas to introduce his father. Yes. Uh, professor Andreas Raharso is a young associate professor at Strategy and Policy Department at uh, National University Singapore Business School. He teach a uh, new module called Next Practice to drive the next practice method as the key solution to deal with technology and COVID-19 disturbance. He has collaborated with McKinsey, Google, Boss, Airbob, Microsoft, IBM, and his interest also in management science. Yeah. And he holds a PhD in management. He also completed the strategy program at the University of Chicago. And uh, the last distinguished speaker is just six kilometers from my chair in Bogor. <laughs> <laughs> he is a professor in industrial management from IPB University. I'm glad to introduce Professor Dr. Musa Hubeis. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Musa. Waalaikumsalam, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat, Selamat sore. Selamat sore. Semoga sehat selalu, Prof. Ya, sama-sama. 
Yeah, so Professor Hubes has long experience in academic research and also practical advice on small and medium enterprises and will share to us how small and medium enterprises can deal with pandemic situation in innovative as and sustainable ways. Again, on behalf of the conference committee, I appreciate to all speakers for your valuable times. This panel session will consist of two parts. On the first part, each speaker will have 30 minutes for presentation. And on the second part, there is a session of question and answer or discussion for 30 minutes. This is general discussion. So for all participants, if you have any questions, please write in chat box yeah, so I can read your question to the uh, speakers after presentations and you also can directly ask to speakers by raising your hand so now we go to Germany to meet our first speaker Professor Herman Weibel the time is yours yeah selamat sore um, Dr. Yeah, selamat sore selamat sore Bro. And, um, to Ibu Sara and uh, the colleagues from Singapore and from uh, from Bogor. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, organization, uh, to this um, to this conference. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, I, I saw that there are many, many um, participants in this conference. And so I want to thank the organizers um, that they have uh, gone ahead and organized this event in difficult times. Um, Pak Eko already has uh, introduced to me and uh, he has said that I came to Indonesia many times before the COVID uh, crisis and I hope that uh, um, once this um, thing has, has been solved or, or handled then there will be the possibility to come to Indonesia again because uh, I miss Nasi Goreng, I miss Durian from Jambi and yes. Jenko and all, all the other beautiful <laughs> things from Indonesia. It's very interesting. Um, before I move to the uh, my presentation, let me start with a little story, uh, which is connected to this um, COVID problem. And the story dates back to 1984, when I started my expatriate job at the Agricultural Extension Service in Thailand. Um, and um, in the Extension Service in Thailand, if you want to become an, expect, uh, an accepted member of the community of extension workers, you have to undergo an entrance test. And this entrance test was really tough. It was, um, you were asked to swallow the gallbladder of a cobra snake in a glass of whiskey. So um, I didn't want to be a covert and I was very young at that time. So I did that and my colleagues in the extension service in Thailand, they were very happy. Now in 2020, um, I told this story to my physician in Germany and he looked at me in horror and he pointed his finger at me and he said, well, this is exactly the way you spread a virus, but it's good you took the whiskey. So perhaps uh, the person in China who took, uh, you know, this animal from the wet market in, um, in Wuhan, we, we don't know that for sure, but for sure we know he didn't take the whiskey because if he had taken the whiskey, maybe it would not have uh, spread. So um, let me go to, the, um, to my presentation, Resilience and Prospects of the Agri-Food Sector During and After the Global Pandemic. Um, and uh, let me take the first slide, uh, the outline. So I have five points that I want to make. I have some background information, which basically started. Um, uh, then I go to um, the issue of food security and human health. Then I talk about the reactions to the crisis. I give some examples. Um, and then I talk about the consequences uh, of the crisis for the agri-food sector. And I end up um, with some lessons learned and I hope this can stimulate um, some questions and some discussions. Um, let me start with this slide. Uh, I hope you can see it. It's slide number three. Um, and it's um, a map from the United Nations. Um, and it shows the degree of urbanization. Um, and what we can see is that now a lot of people live in big cities. Actually, by now it's probably almost uh, 
10% of world population live in very, very big cities, um, or more than 10%, and only a small percentage of the population lives in rural areas. Now, this is one of the factors that um, facilitates the spread of um, a virus like uh, COVID-19. Because if we look at um, the um, information that you perhaps all know from the John Hopkins uh, University, who, who give a worldwide account of the daily changes in the COVID infections and, and other information, what you notice is that countries which are pretty rural have very low uh, infections um, and also, of course, very low uh, death um, cases. Um, if you take Laos, for example, they just had, by yesterday, they had 23 cases um, in the whole country and no death. And uh, so, and um, when I look in, in, at uh, Germany and my country, uh, what we see is I live in a village and basically there is no cases at all because people by, by default, they keep distance. Um, and uh, so one of the factors is this uh, issue of uh, crowding up. Uh, and that is what facilitating it. Of course, it's not the only reason why we have this problem, but it's, I think, one of the factors. And this is something to think about. And this is a challenge that we will face uh, more in the future. Now, let me go to the next slide. Um, and th that is um, a slide that I got from my colleague, uh, Professor Pingali who published this very recently in the Journal of uh, Food Security. Um, and um, he has put together from a WHO database, he has put together the cases of um, deaths from infectious diseases. And what you see is that a lot of the infectious diseases are of zoonotic origin. So when we talk about the food sector and um, the agri-food uh, complex, then we have to think of animals and we have to think of um, livestock production. And I will show this later in my slide uh, that this is uh, really a special um, issue in, in this topic. So what you see on this uh, slide here is that all the green bars are diseases of zoonotic origin. And this is the number of deaths from those diseases between January and May. And you could see by that time, COVID-19 was the number third, was the third. So there were other diseases who had more death cases on a global scale. Now, this may have changed by now uh, when we have, uh, I think, um, one million deaths from COVID uh, already. Uh, but it's, it's the, the problem is in the animals. The problem is because of the, um, well, first of all, the consumption of animals from the wild the um, restriction of the space um, of uh, animals in nature and the way we produce uh, livestock, the way we produce meat. And I will come back to that um, uh, in some later slides in some of my examples. Now, going a step back, and one thing I think is pretty clear that when we uh, look at um, the connection between COVID-19 and the agri-food sector, we have to think about the relationship between food and health. Um, and the COVID-19 actually reminds us what food is actually about. And I have three points to state here. And the first is that food is critically important to human health and well-being. So food is something special. It's food is and it's the second point, food has a unique status in our lives. It's different from other goods, from cars, from computers, from, from other consumption goods, because food we ingest. We don't do this with computers, although some young people, they probably behave like that, but it's pretty different. And the third point is that food is what I call intrinsically significant to the human functioning. It's not just instrumentally significant, which means we don't just use food to fill up our stomach. Again, although some people do that, and it's not like filling up the tank of your car with gasoline. So food is culture, food is health, and that is what uh, COVID-19 reminds us. Now, when we analyze this, um, the impact of COVID-19 on the agri-food sector, then I think automatically we will come to the question of food security. 
And so in the next slide, I'm using, I'm using um, a concept that was um, introduced by uh, my colleague Sir Savary, uh, from who is actually the editor of the Food Security Journal. And uh, in the Food Security Journal, uh, in um, recently there has been a collection of 22 papers about uh, food um, and the food sector and uh, COVID-19. Um, so you may have a look at that also. And what he introduced in, in his editorial is a concept of relationship between the uh, food security dimensions, which is well known, uh, availability, um, the access, economic and physical, um, and um, the utilization and the stability. So these are generally the uh, dimensions of food security, or we can also call them the components. And then we can link them to the drivers. And as you can see on this slide, uh, one of the drivers is human health. So I'm pointing at that human health driver. And as you can see, human health drivers are basically connected to all dimension of food security. And so it would bring us immediately to the question, what does the uh, COVID crisis do to food security? And then we automatically will talk about the poor and it is the poor who, um, who have to, uh, sh or who, who suffer the most from this crisis. And I think we can see that uh, from many um, anecdotic evidence and from uh, comments that we get from people who, uh, who um, live in, in relative poverty and how this COVID has affected uh, their lives. So what I do in the next slide is I, I kind of hypothesize um, about the short, medium and long-term effects of the COVID crisis on the different dimensions of food security. So in the first column, you see the dimensions of food security, availability, physical accessibility, economic accessibility, utilization, uh, which is basically the nutrient uh, components of food and finally the stability. Um, and so I have given some sort of assessment, which of course is subject to discussion and then perhaps in the discussion this can be picked up. Um, I gave some uh, assessment of how the COVID crisis has affected food insecurity. Basically here we talk about food insecurity. Uh, poor people have become more food insecure duties. And uh, I have received pictures from people from Vietnam, from Thailand, even also from Indonesia, showing me what now they are eating and what they were eating before. And uh, of course, even though the governments of uh, different countries support them, it's uh, by far not enough to maintain the level of um, consumption. So, so what I say is that, okay, in terms of availability, the impact, as we know so far, has been low. This is different from the 2008 or 2011 uh, food price crisis, where there has been um, a stronger impact uh, on, on food supply uh, in some countries, at least. So here, the COVID crisis did not really affect the production side uh, of, um, the, uh, of agriculture. Uh, this is a bit different for, for accessibility. Uh, I would say on the short term, the effect was medium because some supply chains have been interrupted due to restrictions on transportation. Um, and the economic accessibility on the short run, um, this is the next point, was perhaps to some people it was high. And that is because of the uh, loss of income that uh, people experienced when many lost their job due to the lockdown. And so even on the medium term, this would probably be high. And even on the long term, it will be high because as we all know, um, the economies of most countries are contracting. So there is no longer economic growth, there is economic decline. And even for the Indonesian economy, I think now the uh, forecasts are, uh, are, pretty, um, uh, are pretty dim. Um, now, the other thing, and this is what I want to um, especially point out, and this is the utilization. And you would perhaps wonder why I say on the short term it's low, on the medium term it's medium, and on the long term it's high. Why is this? Because poor people in the COVID crisis um, cannot, can no longer maintain their 
a regular diet and uh, diversity in consumption. So they, uh, with less money, they go to uh, lower quality food and lower quality food usually affects the children and the children, the effect on children will be on the long term. So even though maybe after a year or two, we come back to the same level, it has already affected the children. So that's why there would be in my um, assessment and in my hypothesis, there would be uh, a negative high effect um, on the long term. Okay, let me go to some examples. Um, and that is um, uh, referring to some reactions. Again, it's people and experts compare the COVID crisis with the 2008 um, food price crisis, uh, 2011, uh, it was similar. We had uh, that situation, but looking at how people react. And of course, one reaction is that if there is a crisis, people start to stockpile food. And this indeed has happened. And this is a, a graph um, which has been based on a survey by IFPRI, the International Food Price Research, uh, Food Policy Research Institute in Washington. Um, and you could see that um, in March, the, the biggest effect was in China. And of course, Wuhan is where it all started. And here you could observe that um, because of the virus, there was a 42% increase in, in food kept at home um, because people were not sure if they could still um, get it from the supermarket. And you could see that, um, that basically all countries, even in Germany, um, there was um, panic to some extent and people bought pasta and even though the number one item that they kept stockpiling was toilet paper for some curious uh, reason. And also, um, interestingly, uh, just let me point this out, Vietnam, for example, where the infection rates were very low, still people um, somehow panicked and, and started to stockpile food. Now, this has not maintained over the time of the crisis. So this was a short term effect. So again, this was not like the 2008 food price crisis. Um, another example, and again, this is also comparing it to, um, to other food crises, um, is that countries who are food exporters start to restrict exports. So impose policies um, that would be in as a precautionary measure, uh, try to maintain uh, food for the domestic uh, population. And um, here is some, simply an, an account or uh, some examples of countries who did that. Uh, now, most of the countries who did that, this didn't have really a big effect like Kazakhstan or Cambodia or even Russia. This didn't really have a big effect on the world market. However, as you see, the first on the list is Vietnam and Vietnam imposed rice exports in on March 24. And this had some effect on rice prices. So rice prices temporarily increased. Uh, and that was a big effect that we had uh, observed in the 2008 crisis. However, um, again, the effect was only of temporary nature. In, two, in April, April 10, Vietnam kind of changed this again uh, to an export quota. Um, and so in, in by at the end of April, Vietnam had removed uh, all the restrictions again. So, but this is the typical reaction that, that countries take in, in such a crisis. And there were some signs that this has happened uh, also, uh, but to a much lesser extent um, than in, um, in the 2008 and 2011 food price crisis. Now, what were the consequences for the agri-food sector? Let's get to some summary or some general points. First, the food industry um, in most countries was considered as an essential industry. So the governments, although they closed some, uh, some uh, they had restrictions during lockdowns and what you now experience uh, in Jakarta, in Indonesia. So there is 50% uh, capacity and, uh, but the exceptions usually was the food industry. So the food industry was the, is an, an is essential industry and therefore has been less affected by the lockdown measures. Um, and actually, um, in, in many countries, the food industry uh, made a windfall. So they increased their profits and sales um, during, um, this, during this crisis. Um, 
and also in in the developing countries food consumption on the medium term was maintained because many governments uh, Im implemented cash transfer programs now it of course remains to be seen if this um, will be maintained um, but what it also did um, was that more food was prepared at home so uh, and that's probably a positive effect so there was an increase in delivered foods um, and there was a decrease in eating out food because restaurants were closed but perhaps the increase in home prepared food um, is maybe um, a positive aspect because people uh, rediscovered food and, and preparing food um, fourth point there's a loss in off-farm income sources and that is a big factor in many of the rural areas because we know, for example, in Asia, uh, income from farm or from agriculture is now in most countries below 50%. Um, and that means, and so most of the income is from wage employment, either through migrants or in nearby provincial towns. And if, and when people lose their job, that income is lost and it's, not easy to uh, compensate that with um, agriculture. So there is likely to be, and this is the prediction of, of many experts, um, that there will be an increase in rural um, and perhaps also, of course, in urban poverty if people cannot go back to their employment. Um, now there were, and this is two examples that I want to add here, there were interruptions of some food value chains occasionally and I have an example for that and the last point here and this is where I have an example from Germany the COVID-19 exposed the weakness and the things that we did not care enough uh, and did not pay much at, uh, enough attention of the functioning of the agri-food system so let me go to the uh, example of interrupting the supply chain what you see here is a picture of a cow eating strawberries. Yeah? Can you imagine strawberries in Indonesia is a very expensive food and most Asian countries so uh, especially the ladies are happy when you buy them strawberries but here the farmer in India feeding strawberries to his cow. Now of course we know in India cows are sacred but um, feeding uh, strawberries to the cow would be really uh, unusual. And why this farmer is doing this? Because the supply chain for strawberries was interrupted and he couldn't sell his strawberries, so he was feeding it to his cow. So that's some cases and some, so some supply chains, vegetable, fruits that were affected, and that's an example. Now, let me go to the next example. This is perhaps significant for the um, developed countries. This is the case of the meat company, a meat company in Germany, a very popular meat company. Um, and this meat company, uh, company called Tönnies, it's the largest slaughterhouse meat processing company in Germany with an annual turnover of more than 7.5 billion US dollar. And it has about 16,000 employees worldwide. And it's very modern. Everything is very modern and high tech and uh, the way slaughtering takes place is, you know, uh, supposed to be perfect. Uh, but actually what happened was that there was a big outbreak in the factory. And why this happened is that that most employees in that, in that factory, in that company, are contract workers from poorer European countries with very indecent work and living conditions for factory workers. So why does this happen? There are strict regulations, there are strict laws in Germany, but local government agencies are less and less able to enforce these regulations because companies of that magnitude have a lot of power and there is a lot of West interests uh, uh, involved in this. And if, I, if you look at this picture here, uh, which uh, some NGO put up and it says here on this placard um, of this, uh, um, you know, this uh, picture, that uh, slaughterhouses, it's deadly for animals and it's deadly for workers. Uh, and actually um, uh, that is what I say, this is exposing the weakness of the system. We have known about this, but 
um, generally people and politicians did not do much about it and now it's big it's a big issue how do we produce especially how do we produce meat and uh, if we go to the next slide this shows um, what happened to the small-scale butcher business in the past in Germany butcher business was a small and medium um, scale enterprises and so every village every uh, community had their local butchers and even I remember uh, in my um, youth days my father was a farmer and he sold his his uh, cows and his pigs to um, a local butcher and who would uh, and, and that's where we also bought uh, our meat and so we would there was complete transparency and there was trust and even though it was not high-tech it was far less problematic than what we have now with this high concentration of the industry and as you could see from this graph eventually this kind of small-scale butcher uh, business um, of the past this will disappear so it raises the question again of um, you know if we go back to the famous book of uh, and uh, F. Uh, Schumacher from 1984 is small beautiful and so again it's a reminder for us that maybe um, in some of the concentration in the agro industry business there is a big risk and uh, to manage this risk will be one of the major challenges so let me come to the last slide and um, um, to some lessons that uh, can be learned from this crisis First point is that what we see is the COVID crisis is different from the 2008-2009 food price crisis. Uh, and that is a good point um, because as I said, supply has not been so much affected. Prices did not increase, uh, but there are high risks for the future. So we must keep that in mind. Second is the resilience of rural areas. What is going to happen to the rural areas? Of course, people who have been migrants in in jobs in the cities, they go back. Um, maybe a lot of people from Jakarta went back to their to their desa, to their kampung, and that happens in many other of the Asian countries as well. But what are they gonna do? They, um, they the income from from those people that they have sent as remittances um, is missing. So um, there is a need to strengthen the resilience of rural areas. In principle, they are resilient because. They have ways to react to this. They have ways to uh, intensify production. They have ways to um, get food from natural resources. But um, if um, the idea is of many policymakers is that quickly move to large scale farming of Western style. And uh, I think again, the COVID crisis has cautioned us that this cannot happen just in a very quick uh, way and this probably needs some different rural development policies now third point is that rich countries must not forget the poor countries uh, what this means is that uh, now rich countries they put a lot of support on their major industries for example germany gave seven billion euro to lufthansa the airline um, uh, the german airlines or they gave three billion to the major company, uh, the, the TUI travel uh, company. So a lot of money is given to large companies uh, and that could have an effect in, in the developed countries and this could have an effect on the, de on the uh, development country support budget, so the uh, official development assistance. Uh, and the problem, of course, will be in the poor countries and uh, that could lead to uh, another refugee crisis and things that we um, uh, experienced recently in Europe. Fourth point, there's a decline in small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and that is because, again, government support tends to be more on the large-scale enterprises. And it's the small and medium-sized enterprises that do not have the financial capacity to uh, cope with a crisis like that. And what this would mean in the end more industry concentration and again it's a question if this will be make uh, economies more vulnerable um, if we um, allow the medium and small size enterprises to kind of decline or even disappear like i showed in the case of the butcher business in, in germany fifth we need to find a way and impose stricter re regulations on high-risk food industries and enforce them so there needs to be 
um, a, a revisit of the regulations and the monitoring capacity uh, that is required to uh, to um, to regulate that and to to enforce this regulation. So actually, food production in large-scale um, agri-industry complexes, which is introduced or which has been encouraged because of lowering costs is actually not as cheap as it sounds. It is probably much more expensive if we put in all the monitoring costs. So this is the fifth point. The sixth, sixth point is that change the health behavior and maintain hygienic rules even when COVID-19 has contained. Now we have learned in Germany okay that we adapt now more the asian style of greeting so before it was shaking hands and even people have been you know everybody start uh, hugging each other kissing each other and greeting so this has disappeared and probably if this behavior changes to maybe this japanese thai style of greeting which is uh, kind of bodiless that's probably good for a lot of other diseases as well so change in that behavior i think is important Seventh, improve the connectivity between food and health. So that brings me to my slide that I showed earlier. Uh, we need to rethink the role of food. And food is not an ordinary consumption commodity. So that's something perhaps, you know, the topic of food maybe has to get into school as a subject so that people know what is the relationship between food and health. And finally, uh, the eighth point, I think what we need as scientists is more um, good studies that can assess the impact of COVID-19 carefully to a rigorous scientific study. We just had at Hanover, together with our colleagues from Thailand, we had a workshop last week where we talked about uh, the design of uh, impact study in the context of our Thailand-Vietnam socioeconomic panel um, so that we would have uh, a good account of what's really happening, particularly uh, in our case in the rural areas. And I would really encourage scientists to, to um, be active and, and do this because uh, this is a time where uh, very special things are happening and uh, it's our role as scientists to give uh, an independent account of that situation. So with this, I come to the end uh, of my presentation. So I say terima kasih for um, Asa and uh, Hato Nuhun, I think is uh, Sudanese, right? And yes. many of the other uh, thank yous that you can see um, and maybe you can check what, what countries are behind. So let me end with a, with a statement that is from Robert Schaller in his book, Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do. So let's, be, let's last and let's hope we see each other again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Webel, for your insight. I think it's inspiring, yeah. And uh, you have identified the links between food security dimension and also human health, which is related with the global pandemics. And I think there is a strong message uh, when you say in the end that uh, the rich countries should not forget the poor countries. So do you think there is like some the COVID pandemic pushed the world to be more to be more equal, because before the pandemic, I think there is a large or high inequality among the world, and now there will be like the push or the force uh, the world to be more equal. But uh, we can discuss it later. Now we can go to Singapore to meet Professor Andreas Raharso, that deliver the role of human resource on the new normal era because there are so many worries prof andreas during the pandemic there is also the world enter what we call as fourth industrial revolution so there is so many restrictions people uh, work from home learn from learning also from home and there is like some worries so what's the role of human resource uh, in the future so professor andreas the floor is yours uh, thank you so much uh, for the time, Prof. Echo. Um, yes, this is very important statement that you bring. Uh, and I think it's echo by Prof. Weibel that right now, even though my title is Reinventing HR Role and Business in the New Normal, the word reinventing here is a very fundamental. 
I mean, this is we are we we hear this word so many times, but this time is so fundamental. Let let me start with this. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, because this uh, host by Bogor Agriculture University, so I, I use my Jakarta, my home city. Uh, which is facing another problem. Luckily, perhaps Bogor is much safer than Jakarta. Um, but situation like this is happened all over the world. So uh, I can see that no country is an exception, except a small country like Laos, which is also mentioned by Prof. Weibo. Um, and I have to tell you, this is very important, at least from Singapore point of view, because uh, my understanding, Singapore is so quite advanced in biotechnology. Don't hope too much with vaccine. We are very clear in Singapore that vaccine will be very long to come. The earliest, it late 2021. So just thinking that having this kind of situation at least one and a half year or two years, anyone that hope that can be shortened than that, you are keep dreaming basically. Yes, perhaps if you are among the, the richest, the elite 1% of the country, yes, you might get, but if not, come on, look at the medical field. Actually to develop vaccine, it requires 10 years. The fastest vaccine that developed in history is five years. Can you imagine right now? We want to produce within the less than one year. That's the fact. Come on, we are scientists, we know all about this. Okay, using this, okay, allow me to bring you to the next facts. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So look at this. This is the facts that we face right now. It's quite scary. Basically, uh, within one night, there is a fundamental changes the way we work, all right? Before, basically, we were working from the office and right now, we are working from home. Some country might say, hey, I'm not yet, I'm still working from, from office. I only can say, <laughs> because the vaccine will come as more, more than a year from now, it might be reach your country too, all right? So, this is a fundamental changes in the way we talk about HR because basically working from the office, this is the keyword, is basically centralized workforce. And when you are working from home, it's basically distributed workforce. And this is so big different. We know so well about centralized workforce. We know all have perhaps 100 years of research in this area. But try to Google it in the Google Scholar. Try to understand distributed workforce is none. Yes, there is a distributed workforce in the context of global company. Imagine like imagine you are Google, you have uh, office all over the world. Then it's distributed workforce. There is no such a distributed workforce like today, where actually your employee working from all their home, all right? So. To understand about distributed workforce, we need to back in the history. All right. So next slide, please. So if we look at the, the history, all right. So at the beginning, actually there is no office. 300 years ago, the word like you, you tell your spouse, you tell your children that I'm going to work. There is a no such thing because everyone working from home. Concept the office is not yet exist. That's why today to emphasize this, I just want to show my background. I'm not trying to using the, the background because I really want to show you I'm working from home. This is like what happened 300 years ago. There is no office. So this I give you an example, the cottage industry. So imagine like this. This is basically business in your house, okay? The the, the father doing the this is actually for the, the wool, the the wool uh, you create the wool, all right? And then um, your wife help you, your uh, children help you. Don't say this is a children exploitation. Actually, the the work life balance then how actually family uh, raise their children is much better in this time compared to nowadays, all right? And actually how it looks like the, the, the office is like the next London in 1800. So basically this is your house, perhaps in the front is your, your store, 
in the back is your factory and your uh, stay at the uh, second second floor all right so it is look like how it looks like as the distributed workforce all right next please. and then there is a changes coming in a kind of COVID, but very different that time uh, people start to figure out a way that actually can mechanize the way they are doing a spinning they call it spinning journey very famous and you see it's the handle because of the handle is actually make it possible to connect with the innovation invention that time that a steam engine and we have a, a what you call it a deadly and not explosive cocktail which is the spinning journey and the uh steam engine and what happened is next please you see the birth of the factory many people start to come to one place to do the same thing job because definitely it's not possible to put all the steam engine to into its houses right so many people start to go out from their home and start to working in the one one place and becoming the centralized workforce. So this is the, the beginning of everything that we we aware today. All right, next please. And from you, you can see that from the slide that make the way in the factory and the way uh, the office perhaps someone in the 70s still know about this. This is typically how our office was born. All right, and this situation is not changed until today. I give you another example. Next please. See, this is our office, what we see today. So be careful, I have to tell you this, that the way we work is actually not access 300 years ago. And it's not, not be careful if you think this is the best of all. Well, we just uh, inherit from, from, from the history, right? So, and then if you want to, to see, this is what happened when COVID coming. Next slide, please. So imagine we are cozy with our office, centralized office, right? And within one day, depends on where you are, perhaps it's not yet come to you, but we have to work in from the office. Look at the each of the slide on the right, okay? So if you see on the left corner, all right, bottom left corner, that's, uh, I call it a perfect situation that actually perhaps you are rich and you can buy, uh, you have a big house, then you create one room, especially for your office. Okay, you, have, you buy everything. But look on the top of it. Perhaps if you have this kind of luxury right now, you have to working with your children around you or your family, relative, that can create a noise that you cannot control. Even if, they can, if you can control their noise, you're still unable to control the disruption or distraction that they create because they are uh, around you. Perhaps, for example, right now, you cannot see, only able to see me, but you cannot see anything that in the front of me. Imagine in the front of me, actually, uh, my wife doing something else, then I cannot concentrate, right? So, or for example, this is very funny situation that I'm aware right now, which not happen in the office, all right? Imagine you are a high level official. This is actually really happened. You are a big bosses, all right? And you do a Zoom like this. Do you think they are always know how to do it properly? Like in the office, mean sit in the chair? No. I know some big bosses for the reason that I don't know. They're conducting a Zoom from their bedroom. So basically they are not sitting properly. So after three hours doing a Zoom, it's definitely I can guarantee he or she have a back pain. Or for example, this is the, the slide on the uh, on the right uh, top right uh, corner, right? You can see this is a definitely ex expensive uh, apartment, but this lady is not properly conducting her, her job, all right? Or on the bottom, definitely there is a situation which is lack of a good office, right? So be careful. Just to work situation right now is completely different. It's no longer taken for granted. All right, next please. So before I'm going to this situation, 
actually all about the uniqueness working from home as a distributed workforce. Basically, I have to tell you, actually, when it's come to working, because we talk about people, and no matter where you are, you are in agriculture, you are in the uh, information technology, you still have to work, right? Even we, we are professors, we still have to work. But right now, the definition of working, HR related, business related, is actually coming into the full circle. At the beginning, we are working from home. There is no concept of office. And then the industrial revolution coming in, create the first uh, concept of the office because people start to working at one place together. All right. And then becoming the cubicle office, open space office that we are aware today. And then there is a COVID-19 coming basically because of the social distancing issue and the vaccine still long way to come, then they this small unseen things actually kick us back to working from home. Take it as, as the nature, there is a night, there is a day, there is hot, there is a cold, so there is a time we are working from home, right, right now we are kicking back to working from, sorry, working from office, right now we are working from home, all right, next. So, from scientific point of view, this is what happened right now. On, on the left side is actually working from the office. Imagine the, the white circle is your office and the, the blue circle is your people, your workforce. Actually, your workforce all working at one place, right? So, imagine your bigger work uh, office, all right? Like uh, Bogor uh, Agriculture University have office everywhere. Perhaps that's, that's office, branch office or whatever you call it is still actually working from the office, right? Uh, the white dot. But right now you can see that we spread because every home right now becoming the office. So just looking from just from the network form point of view, there is a significant fundamental change how we have to handle the workforce. This is basically the essence for me when I talk about why we have to reinventing the HR and a business. Okay, next please. Now we are coming into difficult part, right? Because as I show you, actually there is a fundamental change in understanding workforce. Without we understanding the workforce, we cannot control them. We are very well understand how to control centralized workforce, but we don't know how to control distributed workforce. No one can claim today that he or she understand how to lead distributed workforce because it's never happened before. If, if, this is a big if, if actually you're running global operation, actually you're the big boss of say Google, running uh, operation typically using a private jet circling the world, you might know a little. Perhaps you have like all over the world, you have say like over 100 of the offices, right? But come on, right now, each of you, if you have five staff, basically I already have five distributed workforce, right? So let me tell you, there is lack of research. So this is, I show you what, what we understand so far with some research that actually happened in the past, because actually there is a, a trend that distributed workforce or remote working is not good. This is, I have to blame Google for this because Google believes that you have working in one space, uh, open space actually increase your uh, ability to innovate, right? But this actually is not true. One of the very famous research, actually, you, you can actually, I can show you the journal, but I think it's better for, for me to, to share with you. It's already published in Harvard Business Review because it's look nicer. It's actually uh, uh, this uh, conduct by Professor Nicholas Bloom from Stanford University is a very, uh, robust uh, research than already published in the uh, tier one journal that basically he realized that this goes like this. This is the finding. If you are actually high performing, you are a very good employee, actually working from home will increase your performance. But if actually that actually your low performing employee, then actually working from home is will reducing your performance. See? Right now, I believe you are a, all of you is leader. Well, right now we are so worried actually. 
when we allow our our people working from home the first thing first that we are aware are they working are they able to deliver their deadline we are always worried like this if you have a worry like this it shows that you don't understand anything to manage distributed workforce because actually you have aware all your high performing employee actually will able to produce better in working from home okay this is basically there is a very good research on this next this is another example very reason because right now i think the change is change is so fast then sometimes there is no journal that can capture this i have to bring actually directly the the result from the company so this is the result from the microsoft microsoft do the uh, force to do the working from home during covid-19 in china i talk about the size of 50000 employee if you are worried to achieve objective of our staff you only have 100 staff or 500 staff 1000 staff is nothing i talk about this at 50000 china alone microsoft they have to working from the office but actually this is based on their research microsoft research they actually have very good one good thing is right now is actually one out of every six employee is actually able to have a better network. This is something that actually Google tried to achieve by put everyone working from office. They create a beautiful office. They bribe you with the uh, food. If you are aware about Google, they, they spend so much on to, to give you the, uh, the best restaurant food in their just cafeteria but actually working from home is able to achieve that more all right so this is an another example so from from working from home uh, recently all right so stated differently next slide please what i want to convince you all today that actually working from home is not bad at all actually if you understand, if actually some of you already lived 300 years ago, actually working from home or the fancy name for it is distributed workforce, it could be source for growth. So for example, actually let, let me put this as a Bogor Agriculture University. Of course, there is a lot of problem for university dealing with this COVID-19 because there is a time our student is not unable to come to the, to, to the classroom, right? and so many other things but actually if you are understand how to manage this distributed workforce actually you can find a solution that even make the bogor agriculture university even a better university during the what we call it as a new normal all right and perhaps you want to ask me more deep question why right why 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 because it doesn't make sense because we still so much we just understand basically centralized workforce our mindset is everyone working from home, they will not working. Sorry, if you have this kind of thinking, you don't understand anything about distributed workforce. I can understand that because we've not lived 300 years ago, right? So I will tell you one by one, what is the major advantage of working from home? Okay, yes, next slide, please. Number one, actually distributed workforce or working from home will make your workforce everything being equal much more innovative so just thinking about your department your department or whatever you call it your group your team basically allow them to working from home will make them more creative and innovative innovation is needed right now during the COVID-19 I tell you why because it goes like this imagine if you are working from from the office right so if you are working from the office typically during the lunch time remember the classic situation we will have a lunch together and because we have a lunch together this togetherness actually slowly will make you almost alive imagine let me tell you my my favorite food for example is batagor right so at the beginning perhaps i don't like batagor but my colleague is always eat batagor soon or later i will eat batagor what that means i'll be more and more like them all right also the way we dress 
because we are busy something uh, perhaps I address address casually like this and I'm working in other places which is dressed formally then I tend to follow them right it's a norm we have to follow the norm right and everyone have the any office have the norm what happened basically the norm with all make you alike and alike make you have a single point of view and having only a single few points actually make it difficult for you to able to see things differently which is we are in the university right we always able to create a breakthrough in research actually the more we have a similarity because of the centralized workforce more likely we unable to come with different few points and more likely we are unable to do uh, innovation all right so number one so look at this. So imagine in your home, you can have, you are free to to dress what you like. You are free to eat what you like. You are free to eat what time that you like, right? So this is basically slowly will create a very different point of view from your staff to solve the problem, which is a lot during the COVID nineteen, right? Okay, next week. The other thing is. Actually, when you allow your staff to work in from home, you have to allow them to start and to end their work at their own time. If you say, we have to start everyone at 8 a.m., for example, and I will check you using WhatsApp. And you have, if you're not WhatsApp and show where you are start to working, actually you are not doing the, the working, that's wrong. That's the centralized workforce thinking. Actually, basically, actually, dealing with distributed workforce, you have to focus on the objective delivery, kind of service level agreement. So when they want to start, it's up to them. Because some people will very productive in, in the morning, some people very productive in the noon, some people in the afternoon, some people in the night time. It's not them to work at their the best of their capacity. There is no limitation, right? You cannot open the office 24 hours, but then they are home, let them. As long as they're able to deliver uh, their job. If they say that, you say that actually, no, my, my culture is different, my people is different. Sorry, you don't understand how to deal with this distributed workforce. So actually the best thing is the collective mind is always awake. Imagine you have a problem in any time, you just knock to your distributed workforce and someone will ready for you. That's a beautiful thing. It's a kind of 24 hours uh, machine of th a thinking machine. All right. Next. And this is more important. We are all aware how nasty could be the office politics, the conflict in the office, right? And not many people are aware actually working from home distance working is create less conflict atmosphere it's more calm because of what just imagine if you're really angry with, with someone and we are doing zoom like this what you can do not much right there is a limit you can you can explode in the face-to-face -face situation i could punch you right but in this situation you cannot so actually this is create a very good situation which is create a workforce that less conflict and uh, less conflict will lead to higher uh, productivity. All right. So next. So I'm I'm already uh, just uh, two more slides from my final uh, thinking. So if you already understand all the benefit of this uh, distributed workforce, and we are aware right now, actually we are unexperienced. We don't know how to deal with them. So what we have to do? This is basically, I will tell you, based on whatever we understand right now, what we have, if you are an HR, you are well business people, uh, what you have to deal with distributed workforce, all right? Okay, next please. This is number one, it's very important. Let me read it for you. We, we, we have to start to embrace new mindset from now it all to learn it all. It's very difficult for some person that high ego or like me, I'm a professor, I have to admit, I don't know. So in order for us to take advantage from this uh, new environment, fundamental changes from centralized workforce, working from the office into distributed workforce, working from home, it doesn't matter because some, some of people 
told, told me, I don't want to do that because we are we doing alternate. Today in the office, tomorrow from home. That means 50%, right? So basically still 50% at home. So you cannot say that you understand by 50% to represent another 50%. So learning is very important. Then basically you have to tell that I don't know, I want to learn. So we have to start as a boss or as a leader that tend to be speak every time. Right now, better you shut up. You close your mouth and observe. Let people talk and hear their solution. Only at the end, you learn, and definitely you're smarter than them if you are the bosses, then you have to synthesize what is we have to do. This is like a learning by doing situation. I don't know if any one of you say this is easy. No, actually it's very difficult. The higher you are, you are so big ego that you understand everything. Right now, COVID-19 basically tell you, you don't understand anything. Sorry, right? So next please. The other thing, this is another very difficult situation. Basically a build an experimentation culture. All right. That allow me to read the mantra for you. Make a mistake fail fast and learn fast. This is very another very difficult things that you have to do to deal to reinventing HR and your business during this COVID-19 because you have to do a lot of experiment and we are aware from our parents from our teacher as far as I know please don't do experiment with your life you will ruin your life if you do experiment with your life Imagine you you just hire an, uh, an exp, uh, uh, expensive people. Are you allowed to them to experiment? No, right? You will tell them, hey, I already pay you so expensive. Please deliver that what you promise in your CV, right? There is no such thing because we don't know. The only know is do experiment. We are all scientists. We are all researchers. Without do research, how, how we can know about this, right? But unfortunately, this is not like just in the academic, but in the daily life. You have to start to allow your people when they said, sir or ma'am, can I do experiment for this? For example, just for, for the sake of uh, for for discussion, actually, it's real, all right? So if some, some of you people said, uh, can I experiment by start working uh, at 6, 6 p.m.? I want to, I'm a very late person. I'm a night person. I'm working very well during 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning. Can I sleep at 4 a.m. in the morning and wake up at 11 in the morning? Wake up at 11, you say, oh, no, big, no, no. Come on. This is what I call it experimental mindset. You have to accept as true until proven otherwise. Okay? With this, I think it's better when we have a big discussion about these fundamental changes how we have to deal with our people, with our workforce, because the situation already changed fundamentally because of the COVID-19. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Andreas. I think it's an uh, interesting point of view, yeah? So it seems the COVID-19 pandemic pushed people to back to the nature, yeah? Like uh, what we call it as historical life cycle from work from home and then there are so many people make a factory manufacture and then centralized workforce and now come back again to decentralized and also distributed workforce okay now we will go to Bogor just six kilometers from my chair <laughs> to meet professor Musa Hubeis uh, he is an industrial professor in industrial management Prof Musa still there Okay, so I'm here. Before Prof Musa uh, yeah. give a speech, uh, uh, we forgot to present his CV. Prof Musa Hubez is professor in industrial management. There is a topic uh, related with uh, small and medium industries and also enterprises. And yeah, uh, he give like some lectures and also being a consultant for government agencies and also some organizations. He, he was also head of Department of Management IPB University. 
Oke, okay, Prof Musa, the floor is yours. Oke, okay. thank you, Mr. Eko. Oke, okay. welcome all participants. I hope you are fine and having a beautiful day. <laughs> First of all, uh, I will I will present to my my point presentation as follow. The first I speak about the sustainability development is a process or way of meeting needs. It means the small and medium-sized enterprises and Bremen today has become extremely competitive and has to handle a number of challenges. If you can see in our transference, the, the first problem in SME in Indonesia, the SME are form of community establishing a small business based on the initiative of a person. It means it's not work uh, much people, it's only minimal two people and one pay, the other not pay. And also the number is very hard, is 64 million unit of business. And then this SMA can help cultivate natural resources that exist in its region. It means in Indonesia, the normal basic natural resource is agriculture, is very comprehensive to speak about Professor Weibel, about the agri-food sector, any other agribusiness, and also agro-industry. And the other, this sector has given big employment to people. Uh, we have thankful to this sector because we can collect some people to work, but underpay. And the last, the SME in Indonesia contribute almost the local income and revenue of the Indonesian government. It's been almost 40% from our GDP. But the trolley is most very hard. Then the conglomerate, a big corporation, is only uh, more than 1%. But the contribution to our GDP around 56%. Uh, okay, the next transparent. Okay, in Indonesia, we have some problem in this area for our SME. The first, the lack of skill manpower for manufacturing, service, and marketing. This means it's correspond to the presentation. Professor Andreas, you speak about the centralized and distributed work. <laughs> Uh, I think our SME not the capacity to work as your mentioned. <laughs> and the second, the problem classical in Indonesia, the limited capital and knowledge. Because normally to become the SME is very easy. You have uh, the motivation and then you, you must work very hard and then you become mentioned as one SMA or is named uh, ultra micro enterprises. And the last, of course, the problem of limited capital and knowledge, normally we find the problem low production. It's when the productivity is very low because the technology is very constrained. And the, the other, the problem, the constraint of modernization of expansion. This problem is related to the limited capital and knowledge. And consequently, our SME is not competitive to create the product is suitable to the international market. For this, I think it's very important to give the industrial training and skill formation. Uh, and then, how to enter the market? Normally, you must have a good quality and you have the system control. As Professor Weber mentioned, how to problem restriction and consequent in agri-food sector. If you want to avoid the problem pandemic as COVID-19. Okay, the next transparent. Normally in Indonesia, we have three type of small 
medium enterprises. The first is micro. It's been it's only two one people to work in this field, and the second is the small enterprises. We have ten or twenty people work in this business unit, and the last destination of our SME to become medium enterprises. It's been we have uh, around one hundred people work in in this SME. Normally, we can characterize of SME in Indonesia. The first is characterized by family-based business firm, and the second, we work in a big spectrum in business activity, and also in very different market: local, national, international, and also global. And we have some challenge in our operation as capital technology or employment. I think this is the factor important how to our SMA not competitive and also we have the problem how to modernize our small medium enterprises, especially in ultra micro enterprises. And the fourth, how to deliver the appropriate technology is need to our SMA. I think the problem is the capital. We have the problem, the lack of access to credit in our banking system. And the last, normally our SMB have a strategy of life dependent is dependent on our system. It's been is dependent on our government and also our uh, facilitate a big company as a big corporate how to become a sister company or a poster program and other community development. Okay, the next transparent. Okay, based on uh, the background of our SMA and some problem we, we face out, I had some recommendation how to increase our capacity to become a good SME. I think the first, we must have a number of policy recommendations have been drawn with the view to improve the role of SME in contribution to employment and income generation. It's mean how to improve its productivity and quality. I think it's the main problem of our SME. Today, we, we made a good product, but the next day we will uh, make uh, not a good product. It's been we have uh, a variation of the quality, and the, and the second, how to reduce the cost and also make innovate. It's been how to create the production system is modern and also suitable of technology existent. And the second, it should to strengthen the capacity building to our bureau as a minister or university and also the government uh, as institution and social activity, how to provide the competitiveness the SMA with the implementation the hard and software facilities and the last how to make the new sustainability of SMA derived business model it's mean we can make a system cluster it's mean if we can group uh, the same business and the different scale to become a big scale in this area and then we can work together and then we can deliver a good product to the market. Okay, the next slide. Uh, I have a conclusion. The sustainable development in SMA is an all embracing concept. It's been economic, social, and environmental, and needs strategic attention and also can be viewed as a driver for innovation. It's been as I mentioned, Professor Webel and Professor Andreas, you must attention about the 
pandemic COVID-19 is not the, the problem simple. It is a problem complex. It means you, you must guard your health and also you can make a good economic environment. It means we can work together between economic and health. It means you must discipline and then you can treat all the people to understand the problem COVID-19. And our last conclusion, in order to adopt sustainable development business of the SME in this disruptive era, it's been the change of technology. We can mix the product here more good quality and a cheap price and also a, good, a big spectrum in the market. It must be developing by the SMA website. It's been you can give the information system network and e-business is action to need to be more creative and innovative than before to survive, to compete, to grow, to lead and to success. I think this is my friendly word. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I think we have uh, need some sharing how to increase our SME in Indonesia in the next step. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Professor Musa Hubeis, for your uh, nice insight. So now we enter the session of question and answer. There are some questions that I will select and I will read. Yeah, maybe some of them are related to uh, Professor Weibel, some of them will be related to Professor Andreas and Professor Musa. The first is from Alejandro Rodriguez. Ruiz, yeah. It sounds it's not uh, Indonesian name. I think this is from <laughs> Latin America or Portugal. Yeah. Good morning in Germany, Professor. Selamat sore di Indonesia. I think this is uh, need to be addressed to Professor Weibel. Yeah. Who are the main agent of change that can get small and medium-sized business back to the boom they used to have before the COVID-19 pandemic? So. Uh, who usually need to drive the small and medium enterprise so in order to back like before pandemic. Is it necessary to develop entrepreneurship in the agri-food sector? Or in contrast, does the economy have to stabilize due to the negative consequence of the pandemic? So maybe this is also related to Professor Musa Hubeis, I think. And the second is from Rinda Triwijayanti. My name is Rinda from IPB University. Although the impact of COVID-19 on short and long-term food security is difficult to predict, but some risk factors can be identified. The question is, with technological advance, is it able to make alternative foods to maintain food availability throughout the country? And what do you think about green revolutions? I think these questions uh, need to be addressed by Professor Weber. Maybe I also will add uh, one more question here related with uh, the Linda questions to Professor Weber. Uh, Professor Weber has uh, uh, identified the food security dimensions and link it to uh, human health. So what do you think about food safety? Is the food safety is part of food security of this is like different part? And I think the food safety also may increase when the global pandemic uh, happens. So there are more awareness of people to concern on food safety. And this is for Professor Andreas uh, from Narendra Parataksita. Since Peter Drucker mentioned autonomy or independence is one of the knowledge worker unique characteristic. Is it possible that knowledge worker can adapt better to the current situation of work from home? Can the knowledge worker are the closest type of worker that can adopt the distributed workforce way of work? And then from Danilo Lorenzo de los Santos uh, from Philippines. Yeah. 
I'm Danilo Lorenzo de Los Santos, a PhD student from the University of Tokyo. Professor Andreas given a matrix obsessed each our culture and office. What are your recommendations on how they can change institution's time and output based performance matrix matrix to adopt to adapt to a decentralized workforce but at the same time maintain or achieve a better performance? Oh, Alejandro from Spain. Okay. <laughs> so they are from uh, European student. <laughs> We are happy to have you here, <laughs> Alejandro. Okay, maybe Professor Weibel can uh, initiate the to address the questions. Okay, thank you, Pak Eko. <clears throat> yeah, actually there was also a question from Mr. Alejandro de los Santos for me. I have noted that also. I will pick that up also then. So let me go to the first question. Um, that was, um, will it be the end of large-scale farming and what needs to be done to kind of uh, revive or promote SME? I mean, this is small and medium term enterprises. Um, of course, also this question goes to uh, Professor Musa, but um, let me try to um, give my view on this and certainly uh, the COVID crisis would not mean the end of large-scale farming. I think large-scale farming is is eventually coming but what COVID reminded us is that it will not be as fast as some let's say politicians who um, are promoting this concept in, in the developing countries particularly in Asia would hope it will happen. So simply pulling out people of the agriculture sector, keeping wages low, and then uh, make them transfer to the industrial and the service sector. That uh, model of, um, uh, you know, that has been promoted long, since long time in the, in the literature, um, the, the hypothesis of, of uh, um, infinite um, labor availability from, from low, um, productivity sectors like agriculture, I think that is not happening the same way. I mean, what we actually see now is a return of many migrant laborers back to their villages and engaging in agriculture. So, so what I'm saying is there is a role for small scale farming, um, especially for the time of crisis. So we know that from the food price crisis in 2008 that um, the small scale farming has been the uh, safety net of, um, of uh, the economy. And now, since this has become less and less and agricultural incomes have gone down in, in, as a share of total household income, this will be more difficult for small-scale farming to, um, um, to perform, even though if we take um, the aggregate food supply, it's still something like 80% comes from small-scale farming. So we just have to be more realistic and uh, kind of um, advise policymakers on um, developing better rural rural development policies. And I think there is really a, a need for better rural development policies that has a more realistic transition of the agricultural system. So I would say it will take at least a generation before you can um, go to large scale farming. And eventually I think large scale farming will be there, but there will be um, also room for some small scale um, and uh, for local production and local marketing. This is what we see in the advanced economy. So we see that, that this is uh, continue to exist or coexist with large scale farming. And the second lesson is that there needs to be a much stricter regulation for monitoring the production processes of large-scale farming. So large-scale farming may be efficient, but it generates a lot of negative externalities, um, which is also the case for small-scale farming, but um, the externalities potentially by large-scale farming could be much bigger and much more difficult to control. And I think that is where we need to come in. And yeah, that question, okay, should there be specific, let's say, um, support programs? Should there be uh, training on enterprises, um, entrepreneurship, I think yes, because 
often, if you look at agriculture extension service around the world, basically what they are focusing on is, is mainly um, technology, um, production technology, and the management skills is something that only recently and only occasionally has come in. And I think that is um, where there can be um, the COVID crisis can be um, a new start for bringing in other aspects um, into promoting um, a more balanced development, let's say, between small-scale and large-scale farming. Uh, but I would say it's not the end of large-scale farming. I mean, that is not, I don't think that's the case. Um, do you want me to answer the other questions also, or just go on to them? There were are, there are basically four questions which um, are a little bit related. Uh, yes. Aside from your question, I it's a bit different. The Green Revolution, yes, of course. The Green Revolution, we have learned a lot about that. And, and it, it's now much more uh, natural resources management for a long time has been kind of ignored simply because we have focused or Green Revolution has focused on germ plasm and on new varieties, on new, on new seeds. And uh, with, the, um, with the biotechnology revolution, this again has been sort of put at the forefront. But we now realize more and more, for example, um, soil management, soil nutrient management is something that we only start to learn a lot uh, about how this can be maintained. And uh, more and more we are losing good soils. And um, that's what would come in in kind of a, in a, a continued green revolution that would be based much more on natural resource management. That's how I see um, the green revolution role in, in this but of course it, it would continue and uh, it would continue to increase productivity however taking much more account of the negative externalities um, now your question back echo uh, food safety and food security yes there is a link between food security especially in the dimension of food utilization because food utilization refers to nutrients and it, for, it refers to healthy food. So also food that is kind of, you know, contaminated with chemical pesticides um, that is, uh, um, that has um, lack of, um, um, of, of quality aspects. That is a part of uh, food security because um, you may have food, but if it's not good to consume, then uh, or if it's of low quality, if it's of low nutrient quality, then of course that would dramatically affect the food security situation of the poor. So I think there is increasing linkage and overlap between the two concepts. Okay, that's most for the moment my answers, but we can come back to more. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now, Professor Andreas, please. Sure. So, um... Let me start with the question from Narendra. Uh, but before I answer your question, let me bring this fact first. Everything being equal, working from home is always winning against working from the office. Why? It's cheaper for the company. It's much more economically. Do you know how expensive a company have to create a fixed cost to provide you with an office? That's number one. Actually, everything being equal, and actually right now, because of the COVID-19 situation, depends right now whether you are uh, working from or, or not, it's actually created a lot of stress. A lot of people complain that they are working actually much harder from home because of Zoom. It's never-ending Zoom, they call it, right? So this is a show you. We, we, we are leader, but we don't know how to run a workforce distributed, basically. So back to your question. Knowledge worker have a tendency to fit more to working from home. Imagine like us, the professor in the university, of course, we prefer that way because we can concentrate, we know how to concentrate. But actually not 100% true. If the knowledge worker is not actually under the high performing situation, allow me to use this situation. If I'm really focused on my research, I'm a knowledge worker, right? So working from home is better for me. But for example, I just finished my research, okay? And I'm start to figure out what is my next research, right? It's better I'm going to NUS and having meet my colleague, have chit-chatting here and there, 
it's actually is improving myself rather than I'm present in my home. So it is very important actually when I said that actually when you are as yes, high performing in situation, then you better working from home. So in a nutshell, my answer is it's not true that actually only knowledge worker is actually good working from home. It's actually for everyone, except if you are or not on the high performing, for example, a typical job, right? You just finish your pro- project, deadline the project, you better working from the office because otherwise in home you do nothing. But if you really focus to deliver the, the deadline of your project, you better working from home. That's basically for you, Narendra. So, and the second one is for Danilo. Um, that's a very typical question I got the get from my student or for my client. That basically they don't know. They consider an experience in HR, HR director, but they don't know if they are so obsessed with the metric that fo- focus working from the office, they are basically deep on denial stage. Because they denial that actually we are right now working from home. And there is no way we can check whether our people working or not, unless we put the, the CCTV in their entire home, which is violate of the privacy, right? So there is no way. Why bother? Put it this way. If you really want to understand how to make people working from home able to deliver. So imagine when I'm running a global operation from Singapore, my staff in Boston is 12 hours different exactly. Are you still want to check them? They will say, yes, please be my guest. If you want to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, please be my guest. Right? There is no way. So you have to create a system that makes sure they are definitely very expensive. My, my staff research in Boston, Harvard graduate, MIT graduate, are very expensive to deliver. Why? You have to know the system. Basically, I can share you the metrics that you can use, for example, management by objective, the traditional one. If you prefer more, the sophisticated state of the art, state of the art, you can apply Scrum method, which is a typically applied by all the software company, because typically software developer is spreading all over the world. All right. That's the situation that you have to aware. So forget you want to check. That's a centralized mindset. Checking is so outdated sorry change your mindset we are in the COVID situation we have to change ourselves in order to always able to increase our productivity and also maintain our growth okay all right that's that's all from me happy to have more if you have thank you very much professor andreas then professor musa who is okay thank you mr echo uh, i will uh, i will add a brief answer about the question from Mr. Santos to Professor Weibel about the SME in agriculture. I think I, I have uh, two general answer. The first, uh, do you know the SME in the world as developed or developing country are engaged in the agricultural sector? because this sector play an important role as provider of food for people and raw material for industry. I think this answer is related to the topic Professor Weibel makes mention prospect of the agri-food sector during and after the global pandemic. And the second, I think uh, is on the geographically large proportion of SME in the world are scattered widely in rural areas. This means the SME should do to create new affordable product or services for the answer as market, especially in the developing countries, by taking advantage of disruptive innovation. I mean, you can use the area of technology then you can make a niche market, not a normal market or a big I think this is the role of important SME in the agriculture sector in developing countries or the This is my answer. I think I think my answer is 
certainly uh, at the response of the SMB. Okay, okay, thank you for time for you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Musa Ubes. Now I will offer opportunity for the participants to directly ask, yeah, by raising your hand and then just active your microphone to ask to the speakers. Okay. There is. Is there any questions? From Bu Anggreni, maybe Bu Anggreni can directly ask. This is the good opportunity. <laughs> Or I will read your chat, ya. Yeah? Okay, the question from Bu Anggreni, Prof. Andreas, to Prof. Andreas. Uh, I'm interested in your statement that working from home can decrease office conflict. In Indonesian cases, while office conflict decrease, family conflict increase. <laughs> What do you think about the situations? And also there is a, another question I think to Professor Andreas, based on your experience, how to develop and maintain sense of belonging from team during working from home? And I think uh, I also will give uh, more questions to uh, Professor Weibel, Professor Andreas, and also Professor Musa Hubes. When, from the philosophical point of view, uh, when each speaker uh, deliver a message that there is like an important of decentralization, yeah, is there any a tendency that global pandemic also push the globalization to deglobalization, or like a tendency or a changes from inequality to more equal equal world? So please maybe Prof. Andreas, Prof. Andreas first. Yeah, sure. So my my answer first to to, to Arif, right, regarding uh, how to maintain the sense of belonging from team during working from home. It's actually is 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 very easy. The the problem is because you are thinking from the centralized workforce, from office point of view, because we always start that actually that. If we are working from home, then we not working. We see a movie, we play with our kids, we sleep, right? We start from there. Well, let's change it. Let's change rather than we we accuse they're bad. Let's start. Everyone is good unless unless proven otherwise. The other way around is actually look at my situation when I'm running a global operation from Singapore. How I answer your similar question about my expensive staff in Boston. Their salary can be equal to director of in Indonesia. I also can sleep, right? Because oh, so expensive. The problem is if you accept the situation, then you create a new a method. I already mentioned to you, right? Regarding using management by objective. The unique thing about management by objective, you had to, to get it right at the first time. It's not like in the office, we can, if we see it's not working, we always can call, there is no such thing. You have to get it right at the first time. It's easy if you already know how to do it. So basically set up everything, the norm, expectation, very clear from very beginning, including what you have delivered, what you have to deliver, what if you not that deliver, but I trust you, you will deliver. That's the the, the, the question to, to answer your question. to in. If you trust them, this is the simple answer. If you trust them, the sense of belonging is high. If you not trust them, the sense of belonging will go down. That basically, all right. So the second question for the Angraini, right? So, yeah, this is very funny. Yes, it's true. <laughs> a lot of, but what happened in Singapore? Actually, a lot of divorce because of working from home. <laughs> Well, I'll put it this way, everything being equal, if you look from the history and from the research, working from home is actually better because if you are have a kids, it's always better you can take care of them, right? And definitely uh, there is no work, uh, work family balance because you are always around your family. But what missing right now is how you manage your family. This is a kind of 
a problem that a very specific in distributed workforce. Actually, this problem is a modern problem because this problem already solved 300 years ago. There is no divorce during that period because they know how to work in together, right? But that's that's a modern problem. I cannot answer because it's a very rumah tangga problem, family problem. Perhaps the psychologists need to step in to solve this problem. But don't allow this reason basically to tell working from home is not good. It's actually more economically better with your people and also increase their innovation and increase their productivity if you know how to manage according to workforce distributed workforce principle All right that's my answer but okay thank you very much prof andreas prof weber maybe you want to give some comments on that issues um, you mean comments on working home and divorce? Uh, maybe no. <laughs> no. I mean comments also about the uh, about the equality, the tendency for more yes. equal work, more yes. globalized or something like that. Yes, yes. Thank you, Echo. Yes. Okay. I think the decentralization or deglobalization, we all have experienced it, right? And we are experiencing it right now because we cannot travel. So um, there has been a rethinking of what's really necessary. So we are start to rethink which kind of travel is really necessary. When do we have to be there? Similar to you know what uh, Professor Andreas has said, do, do we really have to go to the office? I mean, if we never can go to the office again, probably also that's boring. And if we never can go to another country again, that's also boring. And only we would see <laughs> yeah. each other, you know, like this. But it has initiated a kind of rethinking about what's really needed and what's really necessary. And um, of course, in, in, when you take uh, talk about um, um, export and import and, and trading in food uh, items, um, the, the principle of comparative advantage that has been dominating uh, the thinking and, and that has driven, you know, why like, okay, for example, Germany is exporting pigs to China. Yeah, we, we are as a developed country and industrialized country. Why do we have to export pigs to China? I, I don't really know. And it's because of that. And it's because um, until now, we haven't really looked at the full cost of this production. We have only taken sort of the direct production cost. We haven't looked enough at the externalities. If we factor that in, into trade, into a full costing, then comparative advantage will change. And there will be probably a rediscovery of, like what some commentators also said, uh, of local production, of, of local uh, markets, um, and a re, um, sort of rethinking of what are the costs of, of trade. So if we factor that in, then trade flows will change. And uh, it will probably come to a different distribution of uh, the food flows and there will be sort of you know not just uh, whenever it is cheaper to produce it there we will do it there um, if we factor in the full cost then the picture will look different and I think that has started and that I think is probably a positive point that we um, due to this crisis start to rethink uh, the trade flows. Uh, just one example, this is not about agriculture, but it's about medical supplies. We have been completely reliant on medical supplies from China. Um, and then when this was stopped due to the um, interruption in supply chains, then we noticed it, how much we are dependent. So um, countries will think about how much they want to be dependent on other countries, um, taking into account that crisis like this could happen again. And so I think in this way it would Probably, yeah, I would say it would um, lead to some sort of um, deglobalization, not a complete deglobalization, but um, a modification of the, um, the one directional globalization process. And I think that is what I'm seeing happening. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Ebo. So now, because I think this is very interesting and also valuable discussions, but due to limited times, I think we need to end the discussions and I will give each speaker to give uh, closing remarks. Maybe we start from uh, Prof. Usa Hubeis. Please, Prof. Usa. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Ko, for this meeting. My closing remark, I think the group from home in pandemic global is must do because this factor a role in driving business or industry growth into additional productive job. For example, economic growth, export, consumption rate, etc. I think is must understand our all our, our, our people. The pandemic is not finished. You must adapt it. Not uh, uh, it's been you cannot war with this pandemic. You must adapt it and make a harmony this situation, and then you can make a productive job, as mentioned as as demonstrated by Professor Andreas. How this thing between distributed and centralized work. I think Weha is into this position. Okay, I think my simple comment and my closing remark. This is very important to understand the pandemic global in this day. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Prof. Prof. Andreas, your closing remarks. So my closing remark is goes like this. So uh, there is a say that nature, our nature, how know how to balance itself, right? So for me, the COVID-19 is not a disaster. Yes, it's bad right now, but it's just the way this nature try to balance itself, all right? It's like day and night, I really show, sure, right? Actually, at the beginning, we are working from home and we are working from office at night back to working from home. So also your story about whether decentralization or localization will be higher, yes. Because before very globalization, right now perhaps a localization, you like it or not. So it's just a nature. I agree with Prof. Musa that if we able to adapt, like Darwin said, right, it's not the strongest that survive, that the most adaptive that survive, then everything will be okay. That's basically my closing remarks. All right. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Prof. Andreas. Professor Herman Weibel. Yes, okay, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said so far, so I don't need to repeat that. Um, uh, I want to congratulate uh, the organizers and Paeko for managing this session very well. I think it's been yeah, thank you. most interesting and listening to different um, thoughts and different topics. I think this was very good and uh, it shows, of course, we can do it in a format like that, but uh, uh, and and I agree. Yes, uh, the COVID nineteen is kind of a rebalancing of uh, of the this over speed that we had been into. But we hope that we find a way to learn with it. And uh, I still think that, as some somebody have said, uh, uh, a researcher in the past has said, well, international research is still a body contact game. So uh, it, I hope we can meet again in a research environment like this in presence uh, um, in addition to what we have today. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for all of the speakers for your valuable times and for valuable discussion today. And for all participation, all participants for this conference, uh, stay uh, at home and stay also stay tuned on these conference channels because tomorrow we also still have an agenda for a panel session and also parallel sessions. So I will give this back to Ibu Sarah Simanjunta. Thank you, Dr. Ibu Eko Sarah. Rudi yeah. Cahyadi that already lead this uh, panel session one. And one more time, big word of thanks to all of you, three of you distinguished professor, Professor Hermann Weibel from Leibniz University of Hanover, Germany, Professor Andreas Raharso from National University of Singapore, and Professor Musa Hubeis from IPB University. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, invite you to give a round of applause to three of distinguished professors. Thank you for sharing uh, this afternoon, very enlightened to our knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, we have listened very attentively to very tough, provoking, provoking presentation. Very informative indeed 
of these agri-food and sustainable management and innovation issues. We now invite ICOSMI chairman to deliver the token of appreciation and the certificates to all the invited speakers, either to the moderator. We welcome you, Dr. Muhammad Najib. Thank you, uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much for all of the, of the uh, speakers and also uh, moderator as well, Pak Eko. Uh, here, the first is a token appreciation for uh, for Prof. Andreas. Thank you very much for your uh, speaker uh, this afternoon. It's, uh, this is uh, the small uh, appreciation uh, for you uh, i hope uh, you like it <laughs> very nice thank you so this much this is the younger <laughs> version of uh, prof andreas right <laughs> and uh, this is a certificate of appreciation uh, thank you very much for uh, andreas and the next uh, uh, this is for uh, prof musa uh, thank you very much for uh, the insightful uh, speaking about uh, SME. Uh, yeah, again, this is the younger Pak Musa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Prof Musa. Yeah, thank next. you very much. The next for Prof uh, Weibel. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Weibel. Uh, I hope uh, you like it. <laughs> uh, this is uh, actually, uh, yeah. This is uh, the real uh, photo of uh, Pak Weibel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Pak Yes, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, actually, actually all, of this, <laughs> all of this is a part of uh, student creativity. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, Prof. Webel for your uh, speaking here. Uh, the next, Pa Eko. Ah, Pa Eko. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for Paiko uh, for moderating this. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Pak Najib. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, for the uh, small token appreciation, uh, but uh, the most important thing is uh, all of you already give uh, full of uh, insight for this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Mbak Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Najib. And thank you to all of you, distinguished uh, professor and also um, chairperson of the final session one. Distinguished guests, beloved students, ladies and gentlemen, we will come to the end of our opening day of Summit 2020 and ICOSMI 2020. Thank you for your participation for today.